so we'll get started. Um, good morning, everybody. My name is Ben Marshall. For those of you who haven't uh, met me before, I'm Radio Parts resident geek for whatever sins I've committed in this life and any previous one. Um, it means I like the weird and wonderful stuff, and it means I get to talk to you this morning about CCTV, which is, I think, a very interesting topic. Uh, I'm going to try and keep this as product as not agnostic as possible, not recommending specific ones or anything else like that. Just a more general guide on the type of cameras that are out there, the type of different technologies and formats that are behind the systems you're looking at, and hopefully give you a bit of a, a way to start looking at jobs. When you walk out to a house or to a business, how to evaluate it, how to look at it, that sort of thing as we go through. Um, I am also going to try and keep it to the hour. Um, I can talk under wet cement for hours and hours and hours about lots of things, and this is just one of them, so I will try and limit myself. If I get really, really boring, throw something at me. There's plenty of products around, throw the most dangerous and uh, expensive thing you can find, and I'll do our best to help. But let's start out with a little bit of an introduction into CCTV systems and why, unfortunately, why we need them. Um, I'm a bit of a naive 50s wannabe in that I wish we didn't have to sell CCTV systems. I wish that home security systems weren't a thing and that everybody could leave their doors unlocked and, you know, cars with the keys in the ignition and everything else. But unfortunately, we don't live in that kind of world. And as you can see, this is the Victorian offence rate uh, over a sort of four-year period from 2011 through to 2015. You go from around 7,000 offences a year and we're up around 8 1,400 almost uh, in the last 12 months in 2015. It's not, not particularly promising from a sort of society point of view as installers of CCTV and security systems and the rest. This kind of helps you guys out a little bit. Um, the particularly nasty part and related to us is in these three categories, assault, burglary, break and enter and theft. You can see the trend is also going up even just in the last couple of years. Up 4% for assault and related, 9% for burglary, break and enter, and theft is up 11%. Keep in mind that's theft from a motor vehicle and other stuff like that as well, which is, you know, theoretically could be covered by CCTV, just a matter of where you put your camera. Um, for those of you who are trade guys and installers, you've got vans. You've got vans that are insured and you've got a lot of expensive stuff in there, but imagine what would happen if you came home tonight, put your van out there and by tomorrow morning it was gone. There's a $50,000 van, potentially, plus however many tens of thousands of dollars worth of stock that's in that van that's gone. That means Monday morning, you're, well, you're gonna have to call your customers this weekend for all those jobs you've got planned for those first few days and say, sorry, I can't help you. Um, get your insurance company involved, deal with all the pain and the forms and everything else that comes from that. Yeah, nobody really wants to go that way. So CCTV, even for your own homes, is gonna be a useful thing. Um, this is from the RACV. They did a bit of analysis based on the crime, uh, the crime statistics of the burglary rate by, by postcode. And what you've got are the 10 riskiest suburbs, the riskier than average suburbs, and the safer than average suburbs. So where I'm living currently in Reservoir is one of the riskiest suburbs in Melbourne. Where I was living before in Doncaster is still riskier than the average. So these are figures that discourage me a little bit. Um, you can see northern suburbs and western suburbs in particular seem to be around the riskiest ones to be in. Um, there's a little anomaly down south. I'm not quite sure what's causing that. Um, yeah, possibly there's a band of cr hardened criminals down there that are breaking into people's homes. But yeah, it's an Im important map to think about because a lot of you, your particular suburbs that you install in or the areas that you cover in Melbourne are in this. And these are all potential customers of yours or unfortunately victims. And that includes yourselves in your own homes. So be careful. Um, the average rate is one per 67 households, by the way. The riskiest suburb in, Mel in Melbourne is about one in 19. So if you're in a street of 20 houses, chances are you got burgled. One of you got burgled in the last year. That's pretty nasty. So moving on to looking at CCTV systems as a deterrent factor. These are old statistics. This is from 1998. There was a study done by a guy by the name of Horn. Um, he was talking about why CCTV should be introduced. So keep in mind that might be a little bit of bias in terms of the questions that he was asking. But 
They asked criminals, people who had been caught, if you knew it was present, would you have done the job? 16% knew it was there and didn't care, 53% knew there wasn't any, 31% didn't know and didn't care. If you knew the CCTV system was operational, would you have offended? Almost 50% said no. About half of the remaining set said they don't know and the other half said yes and it goes up to about 40% if you consider juvenile offenders. So clearly this is something that has an impact on how people do it. It's not the biggest thing in the world and I basically class um, criminals that break into people's homes in three categories. Number one are unfortunately the drug users or the desperate. They will break in regardless of what's going on. If they see a door that they can get through, that they can break down, potentially to get cash, easy to sell items, whatever else might be going on, they're going to do it. And you, almost nothing you can do short of you know, putting a pit bull at the front door on a short chain is going to stop them from getting through. The second group are the ones who CCTV and things like that can be a deterrent. They're burglars, but they're opportunists rather than anything else. So they're going to drive along the street, they're going to ring doorbells and see if somebody's home, if there are dogs or anything else present. But they're going to look at a house with a CCTV system and go, you know what, can't be bothered. I'm going to go somewhere else and do something. You know, I'm going to go next door, they don't have one. Or there's too many cameras in this suburb, I'm going to drive a couple of streets over and then do it in the next suburb. That's the sort of opportunist way of looking at it. And the third one are the ones that are so determined to get in because you've got something that they want. So in a lot of cases that's people you know already who have got a particular reason to know that you've got $10,000 worth of jewellery unsecured in your bedroom or that that TV that's sitting out in the box in the back room that you haven't put in yet, it's just sitting there waiting to go and you've got a crappy security system. So those sort of three groups the first one will break in no matter what you do. So having a good security system and CCTV to try and catch them or to take footage of them is very, very important. The second mob are often deterred by CCTV. The, the stats seem to bear that out to some degree or another. And the third group, the ones that really want to break in, well, they might be smart enough to try and find where your security system is, take down the batteries, you know, take out the DVR, the NVR, the cameras, the power supply, the house, or whatever it is to get in and do the job. So in that case, you're hopefully going to be securing the cameras, or securing the system properly enough that you're still going to catch them no matter what happens. So it's really important to have a good security system running for any of these three groups. Um, you'll be able to hopefully stop them and do what you need to do. And this is one of the most common ones is displacement. Should have gone next door or the next suburb over. Um, this is a footage out of Britain of a thief caught Red Square on a security camera in somebody's house. And uh, yeah, he was, uh, I think he was arrested less than 24 hours afterwards. So yeah, we don't mind that sort of thing when that happens, but yeah, I love the look on his face. All right, so if we take for granted that security cameras are necessary, what happens next is you get confused because there is a huge variety of different cameras and systems out there for it. Here are three images that I'm not quite sure that our advertising department hasn't just copy and pasted and maybe slightly altered. These are three different cameras that we do. There's the Dome 30W Pro, and there's actually a Dome 30W as well, which also looks identical. But that's an analog camera, runs at about 700 TV lines. You've got a DM30 AHD, which is a 1080p analog camera. You've got a DM30 IPW2, which is an IP camera. They all look pretty similar. Um, in fact, if you have a look at them up the front there, I've got them uh, from right to left. We've got DM th uh, the Dome 30 Pro. That is the AHD version, and that is the IP version of it. So which technology works best for you? Which one's the one that you want to use in your particular environment? Which format are you going to choose out of all of them? And so, let's have a look at the competing formats. Uh, these are probably the most prevalent ones on the market today. Old school analog systems, AHD or 720p or 1080p analog cameras, HD SDI, HD CVI, HD TVI and IP. Um, most people tend to specialise in one or two of these. They'll progress as the technology matures and move on to something that suits them a little bit better. But let's have a quick look at what I think uh, the best reasons for them are. And let's look at the Coax HD Formats Wars very quickly. 
There are four different technologies, not including analog, that transmit high definition along coaxial cables. That's RG59, RG6s and so on. It's the legacy systems that are out there. So much RG59 plus figure eight power. Um, those cables are everywhere you go for a lot of older security systems. HDSDI was a technology that broadcast world uses a lot when you're talking broadcast cameras and monitoring systems and other stuff like that for TV stations. It's a really, really good, robust way of running uh, signals along good quality cables. It was brought into the CCTV world as the answer to, you know, you've got all this legacy cabling, how do I get high definition along it? They brought in the HDSDI because they already had the technology, let's just do it. The problem is that HDSCI is just a little bit more particular about the type of cable you use than it was touted to be in the first place. If the coax you've got is good and the runs aren't particularly long, HDSCI is going to give you one of the best 1080p pictures around because it's designed for that sort of standard. The cameras are fantastic in terms of image quality and everything else that you want to throw at it. The problem is it's not all that robust and so yeah, you can be in a little bit of strife and the format is more or less dying off in the CCTV world. There are far less people with HDSDI cameras as options out there now. We deal with a few suppliers that have got them, but it's a technology that's starting to slow down and probably will die in this market. Mainly because it's having its thunder stolen by HDCVI and HDTVI and to a far lesser extent AHD. So HDCVI is high definition composite video interface. It was pioneered by Dahua and they're pretty much the only guys that still make cameras and systems for it. Their DVRs, their cameras are all based around that format. Nobody else seems to have taken it up. So if you're working on a, a Dahua system with HDCVI, fantastic, just keep buying HDCVI cameras. If you want something that's a bit more of an open standard and universal, uh, AHD or HDTVI are your options. Um, AHD is a basic way of getting 1080p over huge distances through a camera system. It's not as sharp as a proper um, sort of digital camera system will be, but it's a great economy way to get the signal through. HDTVI is sort of the best of most of the worlds. They have a lot of the um, image quality of HD SDI. Um, the robustness of the AHD systems and the old analog systems as well and it's probably something we'll look at a little bit more in future in terms of you know, cameras and options for our systems as well but uh, that's probably yeah that's a very very rough overview of them there are specific reasons why you might want others in and amongst it but this is sort of my quick cheap sheet on it which is do you have coax cabling then they're your five options Analog gives you the absolute cheapest ones and the lowest resolution. So if you've got a really basic system where you can control the environment, analog's perfect. You can get license plate recognition. We have for years from analog systems. And license plate recognition on D1 cameras at 480 lines and 576 lines. If they're in the right spot, you can do it. The right lenses, you can do it. AHD, as I said, is a really good economy way of getting 1080p signal. I'll show you some images on the screen in a little bit of the differences between them. HDSDI for the best image quality, um, yeah, it's a little bit variable but there it is. HDCVI, I kind of have a problem with a really highly proprietary format. Um, if you can only buy it for one supplier and use one set of stuff, I think you're putting your, all your eggs in one basket. So that's just a little bit iffy for me. HDTVI has got wide adoption, heaps of different manufacturers, something like a hundred different manufacturers are manufacturing something to do with HDTVI, whether it's cameras, adapters, DVRs, NVRs, everything else like that to work with it. So it's quite a good coax standard. And if you've got data cabling or you're running new cabling, there's IP. And my personal favourite is IP for most jobs because it's the most varied and you've got options from really, really cheap entry level cameras right up to expensive ones. But there are certain environments where you don't want to do it. Anybody to give me an idea of why you might not want IP cameras on a job site? Sorry? Too accessible. Too accessible? In what sense? Sure. So if you can dial into the local network, you can view the IP cameras or control them or whatever else for it. Yeah, potentially, yes. Um, however, every single one of those cameras is protected by its own uh, username and password. You can have multiple stages of guests and user passwords for them. 
You can, on the NVRs, have usernames and passwords for those, which again doesn't let you have access to them. Um, knowing the stream IDs for a lot of the stuff on the network, uh, some cases allows you to play them back on uh, your computer using a streaming media player, but unless you, again, know exactly where that is, and even then, you can lock that down in the cameras and sort out an IP range that's only allowed to do it. So only my laptop is allowed to access all of these ones. Even if you were connected to my little Wi-Fi router, in theory, you wouldn't be able to get in and control or do anything else like that that I'm doing. From the outside world, there's a bit of a misconception that IP uh, is, has to be connected to the internet. It doesn't. It can be an only internal system. It can be only a subnet that most people can't access on your local network. You can secure that down as well as you can secure any, any computer that's on that network with firewalls to the outside world or just don't plug in the network cable to the NVR to your local route, uh, to your router. If all of that's running as a standalone system, I mean, that's all running there now. I've got my router involved, but the router's got no internet connection. So unless I'm specifically logging into this one with my username and password, I can't do anything with this. So you can lock down an IP camera system quite well if you really want to. Um, on the other side of it, if you want to make it accessible from the outside world, it's quite easy. You know, making sure that you've got access to the streaming data or remote access apps or anything else like that to do it. So it gives you a lot of flexibility there for it. Um, I was thinking more of, um, James, if you can do me a favour, raise your hand up and just wave it up and down and watch the response on the screen. Bring it down. It's a bit of a delay between what he's done and what comes up on the screen itself. That's basically due to network lag, you know, DVR, NVR lag, you know, hard drive rates, all sorts of other things like that that are involved. There's a lot in there that can cause uh, an IP camera system to be a bit slower. They're not designed primarily to be real-time systems. Those analog systems like HDTVI, CVI, H, uh, SDI, AHD and so on are much, much closer to real-time. So if you are, let's say, a you know, security guard monitoring a doorway and you need to see what's happening right this second, right now, some of those are a much better solution for you. If you're worried about packet loss and data problems, say it's on a network that's not your own or you're installing for somebody who's got a pretty ordinary home Wi-Fi system or home router, packet loss could mean that burglar's face as he walks in through your front door is lost between a couple of frames and another one. So knowing a little bit about that and your customer's needs may make a difference to it all as well. I think those are fairly small drawbacks at most times, but you need to choose the right technology for the job. All right, uh, let's move on just a little bit. And I'm going to do a quick showcase on these ones for now. So I've got the three cameras hooked up here. I've got an old analog one, I've got an AHD one, and I've got the IP camera. At the moment, I'm running through the IP network. So that is this one. And excuse my pants on the image. That is the IP dome camera. Now, as I move that around, so you can see, great, nice image quality. Pretty simple, works really well. If I switch over to, let's go over to the, this is a hybrid DVR, so I'm actually going to have to do a little bit of playing around in a second with this one. So if I plug in, where's my USB? There we go. Changing the mouse over. Oh, hello. There we go. So this is currently running the AHD camera because I've stood in front of it. It's got a get off that. So this is running a 1080p analog high def camera, and you can see I haven't got the focus quite right on it, but you can see there's still a hell of a lot of detail in what it sees. So AHD is not a bad way to do it if you've got the uh, existing cabling and the rest. The last one, and to do this I actually have to change something on the DVR and then reset it. So bear with me. And this is going to be awkward. Um, because this is a hybrid DVR, it doesn't do AHD and analog at the same time. So let's get in ah, get something that actually works. There we go. Sorry, optical mouse doesn't work so well on shiny surfaces. 
Let's get out of that. Skip. We go in here. I'll change this and then I will give you a quick rundown. So we're going across from a 1080p to a 700 line one. And I do this and I change to that. Is that on the stream, stream type? Yeah. Yes, it is. So under stream type on the main screen here, you've got a few options on our hybrids. 1080p AHD, 720p AHD, 960 by so 6 four plays, and so on for it. Um, these can be a hybrid device, so they can run an IP camera, or they can do AHD, or they can do analog. It's a matter of what option you choose for uh, the format it supports to tell it what to do. So you can mix and match them to some degree, but AHD plus analog at the same time? No, can't do it. So, yeah, it's a bit of a limiting factor, but it's a bit, again, if you're upgrading an older system, you can change the DVR over for now, leave their existing cameras, and as you go through, replace all the cameras in three months when they've got a bit more money left, go over to a proper, uh, go over to proper AHD ones, upgrade their camera system for them. You can do it as a bit of a, you know, two job one and charge, I guess, two sets of going out there and setting up fees, but. So Ben, you're saying you can't, say you've got that channel, AHD, DVR, yep. can't run four analog cameras and four AHD cameras? Not at the moment, no. There's a, there are systems that, basically the formats are too different to actually make it work that way. Um, where have we got? All right, so this is, this is our little 700 line one. And you can see the resolution drop is quite significant between the two. All right. So I don't like looking at that one, so I'm going to switch it back over. But for years, that was what we've done. And for an analog system, if you format it and get the angle and the zoom and everything else like that properly, you can get a quite good result. But I think IP like that, when it's zoomed in and focused correctly, is quite a, a nice way to do it. Now, let me just replug, and I'll be back with you. And different hybrid DVRs work different ways as well. So some of them have got more capabilities to do it than others. Oh, there we go. Backside shot. All right, move out of the way. So that's basic resolution differences between them. To try and clarify that a little bit better, I put this together. Um, this is always a little bit misleading if you look at, you know, it looks like one image is bigger than the other one. But what I'm wanting you to imagine is that the image is the same size but the amount of pixels and the amount of data in it is different. So look at our old D1 cameras up there, 720 by 576. That was a pretty good standard for a lot of years. 960H, again, you've got a bit of widescreen onto that one and a higher resolution. And then you go up to 720p, so the AHD 720p's, or an IP camera running 720p, like the D52 is, the little Acti one that's there. Then you've got a 1.3 megapixel camera, which they typically call one megapixel. Then you've got a 1080p camera, which is most of the other ones. Two megapixels, three, fives, and then some 4K sensors out on the outside of it. Now you imagine you put that many pixels into a D1 size screen, you've got that much more detail in the image to play with and work on. Mind you, that's 4K. There are a few cameras out there for it, but not huge numbers. There is actually a 10K camera that Sony's been playing with as well, and there's a few others coming out from other manufacturers. So the resolutions there can go up immensely high. Um, can anybody see a big problem when you start running huge, huge resolutions through an IP network? Bandwidth. Data flow. Data flow, bandwidth, network switches blowing, I mean, not blowing up, but you know what I mean. They all start having some troubles trying to get the data where it needs to go. When you're doing an IP camera system, the number of cameras, the resolution, the frame rates, and all that sort of stuff is all important parts of your consideration when you're, when you're quoting on a job. Because you can't necessarily run you know, 32 cameras at 1080p or you know, 4 megapixel through a network at 30 frames per second without the network going, um, sorry, what, what are you trying to do now? No, maybe not. So keep all that in mind when you're doing these sort of systems too. But you can see in terms of details, the most common question I get is about license plate or facial recognition. And as I said before, you can get license plate recognition or facial recognition from an old school D1 camera. We used to get it from even lower resolution ones than that. But it's about placement, lens type, and making sure that the frame rate matches what you're trying to do.
So don't disregard any of these particular cameras because they've all got their purposes on different jobs. And going with three megapixel cameras anywhere might not be the best idea for your customer. Um, I had a guy in here earlier this morning talking about uh, somebody who'd been quoted five megapixel cameras for about $100. Regardless of the fact that I don't think you get any kind of five megapixel camera for anywhere near $100, let's say that he did. What are you going to do with five megapixels on a network? How much of that resolution are you going to be able to record and use? Where are you taking your snapshots from to get your full five megapixel cap uh, capacity? So not necessarily the right one for the job. Regardless of the fact that I don't think you get a five megapixel camera for $100 um, without sacrificing quite a lot to do it. All right. Um, to do with identification, just quickly, there are test patterns. The one on the left is actually an Australian company called Video Labs. They produce pretty amazing test gear for CCTV systems and the rest. They have, you know, uh, image, well, basically big images like this one that you can take out on site and prove that you're getting licenses at the distance you want or that you can see the level of detail or the colour balance or everything else like that. So for a professional installer, having one of those is really good. They cost over $500, so you better be sure that you're a professional and you use them all the time, but they're really, really, really effective. You can come up and have a look at some of the stuff that's actually on there and how useful that is later, but that's their new high def one. Their standard def one is a lot cheaper. And on the right, the ANZ PAA, which is the Australian and New Zealand Police Advisory Association or Advisory Agency, I think they are, have produced a guidelines for CCTV. It's about six or seven pages long and it talks about what the police in both countries expect in terms of resolutions, taking footage off the, cat, off the DVRs and NVRs and so on. It's a really good general guide for it. If you're just getting started, it's a fantastic way of getting yourself across the basic technology and what you should be looking for. It's a good way of specking out jobs as well. Um, and this is a chart that's in there. If you produce this in the right size, then there will be a uh, 15 centimetre distance between that point and that point and that point and that point. And then you've got a whole heap of lines. And the idea is that as you move to different distances and different resolutions, it's where those lines cease becoming five lines and become one giant blur or smeary lots of three or something else. And that'll give you an idea whether you've got facial recognition, license plate recognition or other things as well. So I encourage you to have a look at it and print it out. I think it's a really useful thing to have. Um, one thing on this while I'm talking about police and the rest of it, if you are installing security cameras in your own home, you're fine. Put in a system from anybody from anywhere, you know, plug it in, off you go. Um, stay away from recording uh, public spaces and things like that because you can get in some strife for that. But when you're doing your own home and protect your own home, you put the system in for yourself, no worries at all. As soon as you start doing that for commercial businesses, for your friends, family, uh, as a business for yourself, you'll need a security license. And they're issued by the Victorian Police here and different agencies in different states. Just keep in mind that if you go across state borders to do a job in Moama, just you know, north in New South Wales, or across to Mount Gambia in South Australia, Different police advisory, uh, different police systems, most of them have got some sort of reciprocal nature. So if you've got a license here, then you have some ability to do it over there. But to do a proper registered job, you'll need to keep an eye on what license you have and where you do these jobs as well. Um, it's actually quite easy to do. There's a form available from the police. You download it, you print it out, fill it out send it back into them, you get a license, uh, sorry, you have a fingerprint and a background check. Once all those are done, you pay a license fee for a certain number of years and you've got a security license to install. The last time I looked, wasn't that long ago, I think three years worth of license plus your background check and fingerprint was about 300 odd dollars. Not sure if that's still correct, but you might want to check it now. If you don't have a security license and you want to start doing a lot of these jobs, it's well worth it. Not hard to get, but it's, yeah. It's essential. Is that the same for burglar alarms? Uh, security systems, yes. Yeah, same thing as well. Um, and if any of you are interested in doing a more comprehensive version of burglar alarms, CCTV training and the rest, talk to me afterwards. Uh, there's a couple of agencies I know that run fantastic electronic security training courses, including one just over near the Queen Vic Market, who is run by a real serious professional in this area, which is kind of fun. Um, while I'm talking about this, I wanted to briefly touch on lenses as well. And I'm going to jump across to a uh, comparison slide 
because I like these things. And if I can move it across to the active screen, there we go. And there we are. So, I want you to get used to the idea that when you're talking IP, there are a lot of options you can go through in terms of the type of cameras, the type of lenses, the type of wide dynamic ranges and other features you might come through. And when you come up with a list like this one, how do you tell what's different between them? How do you show what, which ones are most important to you and what features you need to look for? This is off the ACTI, ACTI website. Um, they do a phenomenal range of cameras and systems and they're one of the suppliers that we use but pretty much every camera manufacturer has their own version of this. You know, um, and they will show you, you can select cameras and choose which options you're actually looking for. So I've got four dome cameras here, they're all domes. Four different models, we've got 2 megapixels, 3, 3 and 10 megapixels, we've got a couple of indoors and a couple of outdoors, different image sensor sizes, you've got different types of effective megapixels for it, whether they're day or night or not, uh, their low light sensitivity, minim, uh, minimum illumination and so on. So there's a lot of things on here that you might need to look at when you're doing a job. For me, I don't like cameras that don't have very focal lenses. Um, and mainly because if you get out on a job site and it's just slightly different than you expect, that 3.6mm fixed focus lens that you've got might not be good enough to catch that angle that you need. Or it might be too wide and you can't see that just the little bit that you want to run for. If you have a look up the first two cameras up there, the top row, you're looking at this camera here and this camera here. Both of these cameras have got the same lens in them. It's a 2.8mm to 12mm very focal lens. I've got one of these set like this. We've got quite a na narrow angle. We'll just get Wayne in in the background. And this one here, you can see, is a much wider angle field of view for it. That's with the same lens, the same sensor. Those two cameras internally are functionally identical. So having a very focal one means you can do both of those jobs and anywhere between them without any troubles at all. Having a fixed one means you can do that one, or you can do that one, or that one, or that one, and that's it. So it's a good way of saving a bit of money on a camera if you're absolutely specific that it needs to be this wide or the area doesn't really matter, it's just a general coverage. Grabbing a fixed one is fantastic value for you. So if you have a look at these ones, I've chosen all of them that are actually very focal because I like that. Some of these have got infrared. One, two, three, none on this one. And of course, without an infrared LED, you don't need a cut filter. You can tell that there are different levels of infrared and specs on that, different resolutions. Uh, let's have a look. Very focal 2.8 to 12, and this one up the end is 3.1 to 13. Uh, yeah, and as I go down, there are a few other things that it can do. And wide dynamic range is one of my favorite ones. So I know a few of you have done my training sessions before. Um, can any of you give me an idea on what wide dynamic range is? And remember that from three years ago, I think, when I did the last one of these. Anybody else who's installed them got an idea? Well, it's more or less in the name. Wide dynamic range is about how much detail and black levels you've got between full white and full dark. So if you're in an afternoon situation where you're looking at the sun, you've obviously got a massive bright spot in there and you won't see much else in the detail. To be honest, looking straight at the sun, WDR is not going to help you much anyway. The best versions of it might, but you start paying some serious money for cameras to do that. But if you're inside a business and you've got a doorway versus what else is going on, you need that wide dynamic range. Look at James on the top left one there. Half of his face is almost completely shadowed. Um, the lights in the background are blowing out the detail, so you can't see the you know, sensors on the ceiling and things like that as well as you might be able to. Switching wide dynamic range on will give you more um, artificial looking footage but it will give you more details in those black levels to do it. Um, yeah, very important feature to look for if you're doing jobs that have got variable lighting particularly. Um, and yes, there are a whole heap of other, in terms of software features that these cameras will do, providing your NVR and NAS drive or whatever else supports it as well. But so that give you a, a I know it's a very quick overview of a camera list, but these are all dome cameras. They've got specific features. It's a matter of which ones you choose that are important to you. That makes sense, more or less. All right, moving on, because I'm on the wrong slide. Let's try that again. Beautiful. 
IP camera systems need hard drives. Um, the police recommend on that sheet that you have at least 31 days worth of recording time on what you're trying to do, which means you're probably going to need a pretty bloody big hard drive or multiple hard drives. But manufacturers have different standards for drives. There are yeah, entry-level consumer drives, there are, well, let's say for Western Digital, you've got green series, black series, blue series, red series, purple series drives. There's a whole stack of different ones. Now, Western Digital aren't just trying to corner as much of the market as possible by splitting it up. There are actually very good reasons why each of these are a different job. And I'm going to look at these two specifically. So green drives are standard consumer drive. You'll often put them into analog systems. Um, they're fine for that kind of job. When you start talking about multiple cameras in an NVR, you start talking about a very different purpose from a normal hard drive. So in a computer like mine, the read-write ratio might be 50%. You know, I'm pulling stuff off it so I can display on the screen, I'm pushing stuff down as I'm saving, as I'm going, and I'm moving stuff around and whatever else is happening. With a NVR, the majority of its time, I think something like 95% of the time, the footage is getting dumped onto the hard drive. So the duty cycle is very, very much skewed to everything going that way onto the drive itself. A green drive isn't designed to handle that. It's more designed for the consumer level stuff. When you start putting it into an NVR, you want to make sure that you get as much of that footage as possible on there with the least amount of losses, errors, and everything else that's going. So it's still pull, possible to pull information off, of course, but the focus is trying to get all the information on. So when you're doing an NVR system, look for a surveillance class drive. Um, Western Digitals is the purple, they're the one that we supply. There are ones from all the other, you know, from the other major manufacturers as well. They've got some specific firmware differences between them and some are better than others, so it's worth keeping an eye on um, the features that you're looking for there. Um, the Western Digital, just to give you the brief overview, have three year warranties on them as well, which is nice, and they have a caching algorithm in the drive firmware that means less sort of write errors and less lost frames. So really, really specific for NVRs. It's not that you couldn't put it into your computer and have it as a PC drive as well, but it wouldn't really be the best use of your time. All right, and yes, green versus purple. Pur Kermit actually did go purple very briefly for a special thing as well. Um, I'm going to move on slightly. Um, when we're talking power, I'm going to talk general power overall. On an old analog system, these were your friend. It's 12 volt DC power supply or a 24 volt AC power supply depending on the run. Um, anybody tell me why you might want 24 volts AC over 12 volts DC on a longer run particularly? Sorry? Voltage drops, the biggest one. Um, the further you run a cable, the more DC losses, or the more losses there are through the cable, through heating and other stuff like that. So if you run 150 meters on a 12 volt system at half an amp, you might lose 15 to 20% of your power. Um, when you go from 12 volt down to about nine or 10 volts, that starts to have some impact on when the cameras can work or can't work. And it doesn't take much more of a heating loss if the cable's slightly nicked or bent or broken for that to drop out altogether. So there are reasons to go for it and to calculate that voltage drop, particularly if you're running longer ones. In a lot of cases, it's easier to run a local power supply than it is to try and worry about how much power is getting lost over the cable, but that's always an option. Um, through this one, you can run through a Cat5 or Cat6 system with power and video for analog, and there are versions of this one for AHD as well. They are different. We've still got some legacy ones for analog systems that will be a lot cheaper. The ones that have got HD in the name will work with AHD ones. You can't put an analog one, uh, sorry, a HD, AHD one into an old one because they don't even work over short distances. So be very careful about which ones you use for it. Um, in terms of HD, SDI, it's a pretty similar thing. HD, TVI and CVI, they can do similar sorts of jobs over specific Cat5, Cat6 balance with power locally or power remotely. Most of them are off 12 volts. Some will be dual power of 24 volts AC or 12 volts DC. When you come to IP, it's a slightly different beast. IP cameras have often got, well, in our case, all of ours have got local power possible. So you've still got a DC socket onto it, so you can power it up locally. We've got an analog video output, so when you're adjusting the lens and focus and the rest of it, you don't have to go back to the DVR or the NVR and, and check it out. 
but the local power here is an option. Otherwise, everything in this case is being fed through the Cat5 or Cat6. My NVR has got PoE ports on it. PoE is power over Ethernet, and that provides enough power for those cameras to do their job, whether it's at night time for infrared or during the daytime. So um, the four channel and eight channel systems that we've got have got that built in. Most commonly out there, four channels and eight channels have got PoE hubs built into them. That's pretty easy. The problem starts to come when you go into 16 channel units, 32 channel units, when you start using pan tilt and zoom cameras that pull more power and other stuff like that as well. Um, a lot of the 16s and 25, 25 channels and 32 channel NVRs have no power on the PoE side at all. They don't even have the network ports at the back to plug your cameras into it. They require you to buy a network switch that's got power over Ethernet on it or power over Ethernet injectors like this one. So it plugs into 240 volts one side. You've got your data input and you've got your data and power output. So Cat5 into the normal switch, Cat5 into the camera, or Cat6, Cat6. And this has got enough juice to power up the camera and send the information back down to your switch and off you go. Um, there are a heap of different options for these. Be very, very careful. Have a look at how much power your camera draws. Have a look at the overall power available on the switch and then put the two things together. That one up the top, the, the T, um, TS8 Pro from Ubiquiti, that's a 150 watt PoE switch. It's got eight ports on it. Um, great, fantastic, works really well. There are eight port switches I have here in stock where only four of the ports are PoE and it's got about a 32 or a 50 watt total PoE load coming out of it. So yeah, a few cameras, no problem at all. But if you buy that thing thinking you're gonna have all eight channels working, you're gonna have a bad time. So be very careful about which switches you buy. Just because it says PoE, doesn't mean it's gonna have enough power to do what you wanna do, and enough ports to actually do what you want to do. That makes sense? Actually, it probably doesn't make sense. It's a bit silly, but it's the way the industry's done it for a long time now. Um, so yes, keep that in mind. Um, this obviously is the eight channel that I'm using here. We've got one normal network port which is connected to my router and I've got eight PoE ports here and a single power supply for the whole unit. Some of our other systems run dual power supplies. One power supply is for the PoE side and the other one's for the rest of the system itself. Um, one's 12 volt and the other one's 48 volt. Please don't put the wrong one into the wrong socket. Um, it doesn't really kill anything from what uh, Nian was telling me, but it's not really going to do much of a job if you plug the 12 volt one into the PoE side. So be a little bit careful on that. Otherwise, that's the cabling done for IP. When I used to do quotes for analog systems, you start with cameras, you look at cabling, you look at balance, if you're going to run Cat5, you look at power supplies, power splitter leads, you know, maybe a powered balance that runs at the head end, then you've got the monitor and then you've got all this other stuff. A quote that I would do for them might be eight or nine items long. For an NVR, cameras, data cable, NVR, hard drive, maybe a screen, that's it. You're missing all those extra steps. It's a matter of running that data cable out there. And I'm sure all of the installers are data cable certified to run that in your businesses and everywhere else you go. Um, pay attention to the specs and the details on that. If you get it right, this stuff works really well. I had one particular customer who um, had problems with our PoE cameras and an NVR, first generation one. He had through wired all of his uh, Cat5 and Cat6s. In other words, one to one, two to two, three to three, four to four, five, six, seven, eight, straight in, straight out. No twists, no nothing, just straight in, straight out. Apparently he's been doing it for 20 years um, that way. But what happens is the PoE power that's in there isn't going where it's supposed to go. And so you get the 12 volt power comes through one of the data lines or the clock line or something else. So be very, very careful when it comes to data cabling. Um, and if you've got a data tester, most of them, all they do is test what's connected to what, copper to copper. And so they'll look fine that everything's connected up properly, unless you've got one that can actually test the twist properly or the data rate or can pick up PoE coming through it, you could end up in strife as well. I've got a big test tool at the back here, which you can have a look at in a little bit. Um, I'm sort of running towards the end of my time, so I don't want to show you the whole way through it now. 
but the test tool can pick up IP cameras, SDI cameras, analog ones, can locate them on a network, change IPs, it's got a browser so you can log into the interface and do everything else. Basically a PC in your pocket with power supplies for cameras and everything else but all built in. Really useful thing to have if you're doing a lot of these jobs. All right, so that's power. Um, I'm just going to have a quick look at something. Make sure I was covering all the stuff I wanted to. Yes, all right. So let's go back over to this. Let's move on and have a quick look at a couple of different jobs. All right, so I've got a house layout here. Uh, it is a plan that I found online and I've obscured which developer and builder used it. This is, you know, we're just going to consider this as a normal house. We've got master suite with en, uh, with en suite here, office, entryway, media, a couple of bedrooms over this side, activity rooms, secondary laundry and bath, garage through the front here, big veranda, meals area out the back, not so nice big windows, and alfresco and looks like sliding doors on there for it. So your customers walked up to you and said, this is my house, how do I protect it? What do I need to do for CCTV? Who wants to have a start on what you would look at first, what you would discuss with the customer first. Front door. Front door, it's a good place. Back door, entranceways, really good places to start. Garage, definitely. A lot of people put a lot of uh, valuable things in their garage. Uh, you know, cars, tools, equipment, whatever else might be in there, it's a good spot to get to. And a lot of garage doors are not necessarily the best secured things in the world as well. I'll often be basic key locks and hit that with a crowbar the right way and up you go. Not that I'm advocating that at all, but if you lock yourself out of your house, that might be a way you get in at the last, at the last attempt. Um, so yeah, entranceways and doorways are great, but which technology are you going to use for this house? Do you want to use an analog, an AHD, a t HD, SDI, TVI, CVI, or an IP camera system for it? What do you think for an average house? Would you get any benefit from running old school analog in a house this size? Pretty easy, cheap, reliable, wouldn't it? So you can do that quite simply for not a lot of money. So if your customer is, let's say, light of wallet, it's not a bad way to do it. You'll still have CCTV and some protection for it. If you choose the right gear, you can still remotely access it, view it from wherever you want to go. You can trigger pan tilt and zoom cameras and do a whole heap of stuff like that with analog without a lot of money spent on it. If you've got existing cabling, you know, analog or one of the high definition over coax formats might be a really good option for you. Um, you'll get a lot of the great resolutions if you go for a, a HD SDI or TVI format if it's capable of it and you get real time. So you can monitor everything that's going on right now. So if you have that adorable little puppy or kitten that you want to watch romping around the living room when you're not there, this isn't a bad way to do it through an analog system like that. For me, if this was my house, I'd be putting IP into it. And that's partly because I'm a nerd, but also because I like the options that I've got. So for my front door camera that's here, I can put a camera up on this side looking directly at the person as they walk up to my front door. Nice little narrow angle one so I don't cover all the yard because I don't care what's going on in the rest of the yard. I want to know about that person that rang my front doorbell, left the bag of dog poo on fire and then ran away. <laughs> I want to know about that guy so I need to see that camera right there. If I put one out on the front of here, I could cover the rest of my front yard and probably a bit of the street. If I put it over here, it's probably more likely I can see in and out of my driveway or across the front of my building where my media room is. My guess is there's going to be a lot of expensive stuff in a media room. My projector, my home theatre amp, my speakers. Come and speak to us after about any of those things for your own home or installations. But it could be a very expensive room that you've got at the front there. The office is also just next to the entranceway. So having the right camera there will enable you to see somebody who might try to go up and break through the window as well. So maybe a little bit wider angle would work well for there. Out the back you've got a couple of big sliding doors in the alfresco area. So it's more a matter of you've got a, a ceiling here but is it open? Can you have exposed cabling or whatever else for it? You might want a camera pointing back in this way towards the doors. Can you tell me why you might not want it pointing out towards the yard and out towards the sun and whatever else might be going on there? 
definitely. Yeah, and motion detection, if you put that on there, the tree moving in the backyard will set off the motion detection and you'll get more false alarms than pos and actual things. Um, good NVRs and systems have got the ability to distinguish between false alarms and other ones. You can set, set specific zones and threshold levels and other stuff like that as well. So there are options there if you absolutely have to. But the other reason for me is the lighting conditions are much more varied when you're pointing it directly out into your yard. If you're getting that reflected bit of sun off a pool or a building that might be out the back or the garage window, or sorry, not a garage, but a you know, shed out the back, or the neighbours have a spotlight that goes on at night time and it mucks up your night vision on your cameras. Having it pointed into an area where you control is a lot better for you overall. But depends on the customer. You know, after all, you're there to serve them. If they want one that can observe the neighbour's fence because they're sick of the dog, you know, I don't know, jumping over it, then absolutely, you can definitely do that. And other than that, you know, some people might want area cameras to cover off the side here or out the back here down the side of the building if you've got narrow laneways to the next door neighbours there's plenty of options there for it. it's a matter of how many cameras you want um, for those of you who have installed security cameras how many of you have actually ever installed them inside somebody's house yeah Ian's done a couple I'm sure yeah yeah there's been a few out there most people tend not to put them inside their own homes they want to cover the entrances and exits and things like that there's a a slight voyeuristic thing, I think, when you put it inside your own house. You're spying on yourself and your family and the rest. But again, in that kitten or puppy scenario, you know, a lot of people still do it that way. People leave their webcams on while they're at work to see what the dog gets up to in the living room or whatever else might be happening there. There's, it's more about what your customer wants than anything else. If they, want, if they want a camera on every single door, you can do it. If they want a camera in every single room, in the cupboards, in the laundry, in the kitchen, doesn't matter, you can do that if you want to. Um, how many cameras can you run off a traditional analog system before we start running out of space fast? Maybe 16? There are some very rare 32 channel ones out there. If you put 16 cameras around this house, you've covered pretty much everything, up including the guy scratching his privates in the media room. So, yeah, the number of cameras, up to the budget and up to the up to the customer. All right, we're going to do one last one. This is more of an industrial building. So we've got uh, you've got workrooms and offices around here, storage spaces, more offices, uh, suites, workrooms, offices. I don't know what incubation management is. That sounds weird to me. Mechanical workroom, loading docks, manufacturing, more offices, CAD rooms, offices, interns. Intern here gets an office. This is a very progressive company. You've got bathrooms, training rooms, conference rooms, and so on. This is a much more complicated building. And the use of the job, uh, sorry, the use of the building will determine the cameras you choose and what goes on with it. This office might be complicated enough that you have a security guard station. And they're sitting there watching these cameras all the time rather than walking around the entire building every 15 minutes because. It's much easier to sit in a chair and look at all the cameras than it is to actually wander around and check every corridor and every doorway. So again, keeping in mind the, the doors to the outside, your loading docks and loading zones to see when trucks back into your, uh, back, into your back door that they're not supposed to. Looking at the industrial areas where they're manufacturing so you can keep an eye on what's going on or process line information about exactly how many are going along that line. There's a lot of options here again for CCTV and how it's put together, whether it's for security or whether it's actually for management of the facility itself. I had a job a couple of years ago for a guy up in Darwin who's a massive manufacturer of fruit and he um, doesn't spend a lot of time in Australia and relies on other people to do his work for him and he rakes in the profits while enjoying himself and resorts overseas. He wanted to be able to watch the production line from his mobile phone while he's sitting on a beach sipping drinks of his choice. So he's got a system that allows him to see how many pieces of fruit are zipping along that line every second. You know, he's got overviews of his factory and other stuff like that as well. So the options there are quite massive. But looking at a system like this one, discussing it with your customers, working out whether they have an internal network, which they probably do in an office this size. If you dump 32 cameras into their normal network, 
What happens to all their normal network traffic and their internet and everything else that goes on? Their IT guy is going to love you. So on a bigger job like this one, talk to them about their IT situation. If they've got a permanent IT member of staff, contact him. Walk him through it, get him to work with you. I'm saying him a lot here, it's not always him, but in general my experience has been that IT guys at most organisations tend to be uh, people like me, unfortunately. So making sure that they're on board with you and understanding what you're doing so that you don't disrupt their network is very important as well. And that's all part of the consideration, part of your quoting process and everything else. I guarantee you there's a lot of uh, backyard installers out there who will go onto a job site like this, just chuck in a PoE switch, put all the cameras in, then just plug it into the network and then everybody wonders why they have no more internet left. There's, that happens on an almost daily basis. So be very, very careful about what you do and you'll be a professional in your industry. I'm like, the uh, cowboys that are out there. All right, that's the last of the official bits that I wanted to take you through. Um, if you'd like, I've got a couple of minutes left, I can sh plug in the test tool and show you how this thing works. Does that sound all right to you? You okay with that? And then we can get you back to your real lives. Now, I'm on limited cable lengths here, so bear with me. And I may be talking at you from behind the TV for a fair chunk of this as well. So this is a test, call, test tool that we've got called the M700L. Now, which one am I going to? That one. And let's see if we get the thing coming up. Um, seven inch touchscreen on this thing. So it runs an operating system a little bit like an Android uh, tablet would, but with composite HDSDI inputs. We've got pan, tilt and zoom controls on here as well. So if you want to test out your camera, you can do that from here. You've even got a little, infra, a little LED torch on this one. So if you're in a roof space and you're trying to look at something, this is your all-purpose tool. On the other side of it, you've got, I'm trying to do this here, power supply in. You've also got power out. It's a 12 volt power out. So you can plug into a camera and power it up. So when you set up your zoom and focus or set up your PTZ, uh, sorry, your PoE stuff, you can power it directly from the batteries that are built into this thing. I'm running enough power here because I haven't had it charged for long enough, so the batteries are a little bit flat. Um, other stuff, Ethernet, PoE, supply, all built into this one as well. I've got it plugged into my local network here, into my router. So if I do onvif and do onvif HD, so you can watch what I'm doing on the screen. This is automatically looking for any cameras that might be up on my network and it has found four. It's found one, two, three, and four. There's two Acti cameras here and two DOS ones. The reason I use the Acti ones here is number one, I like them. I think they're really good cameras. But number two, they're powered off the same NVR that the rest of ours are. They're connected to the same system. They're running the same thing, which means you can use different cameras on different systems. These are using a profile called OnVIF. ONVIF, which is an industry standard. As long as you've got stuff that supports ONVIF everywhere you go, it'll work. So you can put an Acti camera with a QNAP NVR or NAS drive. You can put a DOS camera with a Mobotics camera in an IP system from 2N or whatever else it is that you want to do. So ONVIF is important that way. On here, I've got this and I'll do that. And this is one of my uh, Oops, I've got to log in first. There we go. Log in, go to this, and this is my camera feed from one of my little IP cameras. It's displaying on my screen here and not up on the big screen for some reason. I can't be sure. Might be a resolution thing. Yeah, it seems to be. All right. The most common way you'd be using this is probably not with this anyway. But, uh, sorry, not with it hooked into a big screen. You'd be doing this up on a ladder or doing a job as you go. Uh, log into this, go to the Acti. Yeah, no, it's not going to show them up on the big screen for whatever reason. But on here, I can kind of show you, you've got a seven inch version of that on your screen itself. So you can see exactly what that IP camera is seeing. You don't have to have your laptop to set it up. You can do it all through this device here. You've also got, if I go out of this, go out of that, go into the browser, 
Yes, this is a proper web browser, but you can also go to one, two, dots. That one. So I'm now bringing up the web page login for one of my NVRs that's here. I could submit and go into here, and now I've got access over the system via this as well. So I can set the NVR up without having to plug a screen directly into it. I can set it up using a laptop if I want to. There are tools and equipment there and I'm going to cover that in our next session in two weeks time more thoroughly. But this is a pretty good way of having a universal IP and analog, HD, SDI and so on. It works really, really well. And yeah, there's a lot of features on here. You've even got a Ethernet uh, tester. You've got PoE outputs and testers on the network as well to see if it can actually do what it needs to do. Yeah, there's a lot of features on one of these that if you're a professional installer you might want to look at. It's even got a digital multimeter. So if you're not sure whether you're getting the 12 volts through the camera that you expect to the cable that you're expecting, it's got multimeter leads that you can plug in and test that off there as well. That one rec retail is 10.99. Trade price is obviously a lot less than that, but that's one that we're bringing in from overseas. The Victorian Police and Tasmanian Police have bought quite a few of those for their own uh, use, obviously. If they're going out on a job site or they're testing the system for somebody, it's useful to have that as opposed to a potential security risk like a laptop. That thing is a standalone device that you can wipe, for, you know, wipe very easily. You can store footage onto the SD card that's there. If they're on site, they can view it and do all those sorts of things as well. So useful device for them. For you guys as installers, it'll be a useful one as well. All right. That's the basics on the cameras, the systems and the technology. I'm going to cover the actual software, firmware setup, remote access, networking and so on in part two of this, which will be in two weeks time. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube, that'll be right up after this video, but just keep in mind that there will be another session to go through more of the really intricate details on it. Um, but I hope for today you've got a good general guide on the type of systems that are available, the type of options you have, and give you an idea on how to start quoting on a job if you have to. That sound all right? Fantastic. Thank you for your time. Any questions that you want covered or anything specific about today, let me know.